Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Shankman Private Client Group Account and Attorney Winter Webinar Series. This program is entitled Tales from the Crypt, Stories of Failed Estate Plans and Unfulfilled Desires. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jonathan Shankman. I'm a financial advisor, portfolio manager, and an accredited investment fiduciary at Oppenheimer based in New York City. The goal of all my programs is to bring professionals together to help them better serve their clients. This is done by educating attendees on the latest topics in wealth planning and by encouraging collaboration between a client's attorney, CPA, and financial advisor where appropriate. My practice focuses on working with high net worth families, businesses, and not-for-profits. I manage individual investment portfolios, trust accounts, corporate retirement plans, and endowments to help my clients achieve their financial goals. In addition to the 15 to 20 events I run every year, I also do a fair amount of writing on the topics of investing and financial planning. You can read my work in Barron's, CNBC, Forbes, Kiplinger, The Wall Street Journal, The CPA Journal, Trust and Estates Magazine, and many other periodicals. After the program, I'll send out a link to all the publications where I publish my work. Today, we're privileged to hear from Steve Malik and Michael Clear from Wigan and Dana, based in New York and Connecticut. <clears throat> Stephen is a partner in the firm's litigation department and chair of the probate litigation practice group, where he focuses on trust and estates disputes, providing business-based advocacy that meets his clients' personal, practical, and financial needs. Stephen typically represents beneficiaries, fiduciaries, and creditors in disputes involving alleged breaches of fiduciary duty, disputed accountings, will contest, and alleged violations of the Prudent Investor Act and its predecessors. Michael is a partner in the Private Client Services Group, where he regularly counsels clients on the far-reaching financial implications of estate planning, estate and trust administration, probate litigation, business uh, succession planning. Michael works with individuals and families in tax-efficient and practical estate and gift planning, including the preparation of wills, revocable living trusts, insurance trusts, and entities to own special family assets, such as vacation homes and collections. Today, Stephen and Michael will be speaking on Tales from the Crypt, stories of failed estate plans and unfulfilled desires. And with that, I will turn it over to Stephen and Michael. Um, Jonathan, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us today uh, to talk to your group. Um, we, we have what I think is a pretty, um, some interesting topics to cover. Uh, effectively, uh, you're sitting, uh, Steve and I, um, Steve is a probate litigator at, at heart. He does a lot of uh, family disputes and disputes relating to estate administration and trust administration, along with some other litigation work. Uh, I'm a planner, I'm an estate planner. So I, you know, dealing with uh, families, uh, hopefully uh, doing a practical and efficient estate plan. Uh, but as, as we'll see today, those estate plans don't always work. Sometimes they don't work uh, because, well, well, we'll cover some of those. Uh, what are we gonna focus on today is real life situations uh, that are playing out across the country. Uh, that relate to probate controversies. Dogs, divorce, undue influence, competency, secret bank accounts, children discovered later on in life, handwritten wills, business succession, and no contest clauses. Now, uh, that's a, a whole lot to cover in, in less than 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, luckily, we have um, an easy way, I think, to do it. Uh, and that is through Lulu, Larry, and Pat, Lulu, Larry, and Pat. Those are our three main stories today that will get us through each of those areas. So we're gonna start with the feel good story of Lulu. Uh, this came out the other day. Uh, Lulu is an eight year old border collie uh, whose uh, owner uh, recently died and left her uh, a $5 million trust, $5 million trust. Um, so pet trusts aren't uh, all that new. Uh, they've been out there for a while, but why, am, why are we leading off with it? Well, it's a feel-good story, uh, and it goes to show meeting your desires, right? Meeting, you know, having a plan in place that captures what you uh, want to do. It's an easy one. Uh, we, we've seen this example play out recently in New York as well. Maybe not recently, but in most people's memory, Steve, right? Correct. Uh, Leona Helmsley, many of you may remember, she had a dog appropriately named Trouble, and uh, she left $12 million um, in her estate plan for care of the dog. After subsequent litigation, it was knocked down to $2 million, but, but it's interesting that she had four grandchildren and she left each of the two of the grandchildren $5 million and disinherited two of her other grandchildren 
for reasons that are known to them, but but wanted to leave the dog uh, twelve million dollars. When when Mike and I were preparing uh, for this program, we read a quote from a trust and estates lawyer in Florida who said, "A will is a, a, a final opportunity for someone to either say screw off or I love you um, effectively." Um, and uh, leaving twelve million dollars to your dog and nothing to your grandchildren is probably the former rather than 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 the latter. Um, but it's an example, you know, the imagery, if you can remember Lulu, Lulu uh, could be, um, this is in Tennessee and it just broke in the news and nobody really knows what happens to the $5 million if the dog dies. Um, with the Helmsley's dog, um, it turned out that there were numerous uh, kidnapping and death threats um, for apparently for ransom. Um, and so who knows what, what's gonna happen, but I would say that Lulu is probably one of the wealthiest uh, border collies um, in the world, if not the wealthiest. Watch out for the new Forbes list. Um, anyway, trust. <laughs> it's, been, it, it, it's a good introduction to something that actually just broke in the news also this week, and that would be um, Larry King. Um, I probably, I, I would suspect that everybody who's participating on this conference knows who Larry King is. He's probably the most famous talk show host in America, if not one of the most famous. And um, he had been married multiple times, and uh, his, his latest wife, um, who was named uh, the executor of his will in his 2015 estate planning documents, is, is bringing a lawsuit to uh, challenge uh, an alleged uh, handwritten will. And I'm going to let Mike pick it up uh, from here to talk about um, the Larry King story and, and the difference between formal estate planning documents as we might know them and, and, and handwritten wills. Yeah, so you know, I think you you look at this matter and you, what does it entail? Uh, so it entails a number of things, and we'll I'll only hit on a couple of them. Uh, it entails postnuptial agreements, uh, revocable trusts, handwritten wills, uh, capacity and undue influence questions, uh, joint bank accounts, loans to family members, and a pending divorce. Uh, so uh, th there's a lot there, uh, effectively. It, it appears uh, that Larry had a 2015 will that most likely uh, that did appoint his spouse, Sean, um, has the executrix under his will. And my guess is that it was a pour over will because he also has a 2015 family trust. Uh, so it took probably took all of his assets that are in his name and poured those assets into that family trust. In 2019, there's a divorce proceeding. Later in 2019, we have what you see on your screen, uh, which is a supposedly a handwritten will. This is my last will and testament, and it should replace all, I think, previous writings. Uh, in the event of my death, any day after the date above, so I guess if he died that day, it wasn't going to work, 100%. Uh, Interesting, because I don't know, what does it say, 200% below it or 20% uh, of, we'll say his estate is divided equally among my children. Uh, one, two, three, so uh, there's, and there, there were, there were five, five children, children correct. Yeah. So I think it was 20%. He started to write 20% to the child who handed him this will <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to write, and then realized, no, it should be 100% divided to, to all five children, I guess. Yeah, so it's not it's not terribly often that we get to kind of look at what is a what is a holographic will, right? And so he, here it is. It's a famous one. We we had somebody who had good planning. They had a will and they had a revocable trust. Um, and, and so what is a holographic will? If you want, Steve, you could just jump to that slide. Um, I think it's it's two in. Uh, a holographic will is effectively um, a will in somebody's own handwriting. Here, uh, we actually, it's, it's actually probably a little better than a holographic will because it's signed. It is signed and witnessed. Um, so the document itself may pass as a will uh, because, of, because it's witnessed. There's, not, there's no great attestation clause in there. Um, but so that, that's kind of the first issue. Uh, it appears also that much of Larry's assets were already in his revocable trust. Uh, so Sean, 
uh, is the trustee of that and will control the bulk of those assets. However, there, it, there were still some assets in the estate. Um, and if we, if we think back to that will, all it did was distribute the assets. 100% goes to these people. So he says it's his will. Uh, it's pretty incomplete. Uh, so one of his kids uh, a, applied to be the administrator. Um, when, you, when we have a will that appoints somebody, we have an executor. Uh, if it doesn't appoint anyone, the court's going to appoint an administrator. So one of the issues is, well, even if this is a valid will, what does it replace in terms of the previous writings? The previous writings appointed Sean, the spouse, uh, as has the executrix. Um, does this will trump that? Is this really more of a codicil because it's incomplete? Um, so you can, you can see just in this document, this simple document created after a divorce proceeding was, was initiated uh, can kind of have some of those long-term effects there. And, and, and Mike, if I could just add, um, this may be one of those circumstances where you really have to pay attention to what jurisdiction you're in. Um, I understand that most uh, of the people who are participating in this uh, program today are from the tri-state area in New York, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, but many are from other places in the country and many states have statutes or existing case law on what works for a holographic will and what doesn't work for a holographic will. One of the issues in the California case is whether this handwritten document complies with the statutory requirements in California. Ultimately, the court will decide that. I'm sure both sides will have good advocacy. But it, it's one of the things to, to think about um, as we're talking about planning and we're going along. So you have Lulu and you have Larry King um, and, and, and you have this dispute. But oftentimes we live in a very, well, pre-COVID, we lived in a very mobile society where um, people would go from one jurisdiction to another, or they're leaving money for kids and grandkids and um, not taking into account what might happen if the circumstances of their kids and grandkids change, for example, divorce. And, and so it's something to think about if you're a planner or you're a litigator, um, you gotta think about where are the people and, and are there potentially different rules that apply um, to where these will be put in effect. Um, there's a good example of that that we had where we had a, a, De a Delaware, we were involved in a, in a case from one of the great industrial families, four or five trusts set up for the benefit of grandchildren and great grandchildren. And one of the great grandchildren was going through a divorce in Connecticut. The trustee was in New York. The trust was, the trusts were written in Delaware and Alabama and the settler resided in yet a different state. So. Um, there was a whole myriad of conflicts of, of laws issues in that case to, to be worked through. So just something to think about how, um, depending on where the decedent was at, at when he wrote this or, or where his will is being probated, um, whether or not a document like this is given effect. Yeah. It, so, I mean, you have, so just quickly, you have the document itself. Um, you, you have, um, you, you have a, a postnuptial agreement that this document uh, would violate. So does, is the holographic will work? Yes. Um, does it violate this agreement? Maybe, right? That will be litigated. Um, and then also, um, you know, how does the pending divorce impact her, her rights uh, under either the post-nup or, or the will? And then there's probably undue, undue influence and capacity concerns um, kind of baked into it. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to watch all of those play out uh, in, in one piece. I guess uh, another thing that you have here uh, is um, who knows how it plays out, but Larry had a secret account uh, that um, it's unclear if it was joint or not. Uh, funds were taken out uh, of that during his lifetime, unclear if those were loans. Who gets picked as the fiduciary, the executor or the administrator will help determine whether or not those are our loans. Uh, but we, yeah, we by, look by, at- by, by, by order of magnitude, we're talking, um, Sean King alleges that Larry King had a secret bank account that he gave $266,000 to the son who's now seeking to be the administrator. But apparently that son was in his thirties before he ever knew who his father really was. So, um, 
you know, there, there's a whole myriad of facts and circumstances. And for those of you who practice in this area, particularly with litigation, that's not going to come as a surprise to you. Um, I've put a slide up here called Avoiding Probate and Will Contests. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, we all know uh, that there's probate assets and non-probate assets. What does that mean? I'll let Mike talk about. One of the things that people try to do to avoid these fights are to designate or set up types of accounts where um, the money will transfer on death. IRAs, for example, um, life insurance, um, payable on death bank accounts. And Mike is going to talk a little bit about each one of those are. In our office right now, we have cases um, that involve allegations related to each one of these areas on these slides. So even though people do these to avoid um, will contests and probate contests, it doesn't necessarily mean that greedy relatives are, are going to go away. But for a whole host of reasons, um, it may be easier and more efficient to do it this way. And I'm going to kick it back. Yeah, so Steve hit that pretty succinctly, actually. But so uh, in the Larry King example, uh, we have that will. The will is only going to govern the assets in Larry's name at his death. Things that will pass through, we'll, we'll call it the pretendies in New York, the surrogates court system. Uh, what doesn't pass through? All of those items in that family trust do not pass through the will. Uh, any jointly owned bank accounts do not pass through the will. Retirement accounts with a beneficiary designation do not pass through the will, right? So those, all of those things avoid the probate process, avoid um, the need to go to surrogate's court or to probate court um, to you know, administer and get the assets to the correct owner. Um, what, we're, what we're seeing is it's so easy to change these things. Financial institutions very often ask their clients, would you like to put a payable on death designation on this account. Um, it's, not a ter it's not terribly difficult to convince someone to say, hey, leave me your IRA. Uh, so we think uh, going forward, there's going to be a lot of litigation surrounding these types of bank accounts uh, and ownership accounts and transfers. Uh, and Steve, maybe before we go to that last case, you can just talk about the difficulties that we, that, uh, we encounter on the litigation side when this is happening? So, for example, um, you know, this is a factual scenario that's being played out in, in, in court right now um, where um, that mom is in a nursing home, uh, mom's mental health is declining, mom changes the beneficiary designations. Um, she has five children, one she is not leaving anything. Um, she changes the allocation among three of the children and leaves 10% of the IRA to a nonprofit. Um, the, the disinherited child and the two, two of the three other children who had their, um, their, uh, their, their, their percentages changed in the designation brought a lawsuit um, claiming tortious interference, uh, breach of fiduciary duty uh, against the, the power of attorney. Ultimately, the court found uh, there was no uh, violation of law, but you, there were a whole myriad of issues in, in, involved in the case from the money was already paid out. In fact, the court, the trial court found that was a pretty substantial, the, the, the money had already been paid out a year before the lawsuit was ever brought. Um, and so it sort of makes it, back, it, makes it difficult to, to unscramble the egg or, or to put the egg uh, back together again. So what's happened with the money? Um, are, are the not, is the nonprofit a necessary party to the litigation? Um, there was a dispute about that. Um, it also, th this type of thing also happens um, in, in different contexts. Another scenario that's involved in litigation right now is somebody has a revocable trust. They're the trustee of the revocable trust. The trust leaves assets to the children from a first marriage, um, it, but the the, the settler of the trust, the, the trustee of the trust is in a long-term marriage more than three or four decades with, with the second wife and decides to pull nearly a million dollars of assets out of the trust and put them in a payable on death account so that when he dies, it goes to the wife, the second wife, and not the kids from the first marriage. Needless to say, one of the kids from the first marriage was very upset by that and, and has started a, a, a litigation. But 
the person was competent, the person was handling his own business affairs, the accountant was in the hospital with him a week before his death, going through all kinds of tax returns. So, but, but it's just easy, it's, it's signing a piece of paper, you don't need all the witnesses necessarily, um, all the bells and whistles, all the, the proper formalities to sign one of these designation forms um, or to open a bank account necessarily that, that you might need with, with actually doing a, a will or a trust. Um, but uh, it just, it goes, and, and again, the rules are different in different states and, and, and laws may apply differently. And there is actually some case law too that says that for, for an ERISA related um, plan, um, that federal law controls the standards by which a state court has to evaluate. So it's just something, if you're interested in that, I have a couple of cases um, on that subject. It's, it's a, probably a seminar in and of its own. Um, since the time is short and, and we have uh, about 10 minutes left, what we wanted to do is we've left you with Lulu and Larry, and, and we've talked a little bit about how people try to avoid probate disputes by talking about beneficiary designations. What I want to do real quick is just run through the bases for a challenge to a will, trust document. Um, there are basically four bases for challenge. They're pretty familiar to most of you. Mike touched upon some of them at the introduction, but there are four bases for challenge. Lack of due execution, lack of capacity, undue influence, and fraud. Um, lack of due execution, we don't need to go into. We did have a case once where um, a guy downloaded an internet will. He left an estate of some 12 to $14 million to charity, but didn't want to pay for a trust and estates lawyer. So he had his neighbor print out a document. Um, he signed where the notary was supposed to sign. The notary signed where he was supposed to sign, and none of the witnesses signed in the appropriate place. And so the court gave us, gave, gave us a hard time about probate, but ultimately we got there. That's typically not where you see the challenges. Typically, you see challenges in lack of capacity and undue influence. Um, each one of these is, is talked about in the slides, things to focus on, but I just want to touch on capacity. Capacity, as we think about it, might be a little different than what we normally think of somebody's mental state or mental acuity. Capacity in this context of trust and estates documents, if you, you'll see the slides after, um, is really, does the testator or the settler understand the nature and consequence of making a will? Does he or she understand what's gonna happen by the terms that they're putting in their document, what the result will be? Does he or she know the nature and extent of their assets or property? And does he or she know who the objects of his or her bounty were? The time period that you focus on is, is when the document was executed. So if somebody, for example, has dementia and by the time they pass away, they have no idea where they are and they have no idea about anything that's going on in life. That's not when you focus on, it's when you actually, when he or she signed um, the documents at, at issue. And, and that's important because um, that gets lost sight of. People look at pictures and videos. In fact, we had one case where the other side kept showing pictures of mom and her mental faculties, but all of those pictures were taken years after she had executed her estate planning documents. Um, so you're, you're focusing on, on that time when the documents were executed. And um, that plays out in a lot of different contexts, but we thought that, you know, many people are sports fans, even if you're not sports fans, almost everyone's heard of the National Football League and almost everyone who's heard of the National Football League has heard of a football team called the Denver Broncos. And um, the owner of the Denver Broncos is a gentleman named Pat Bolin. He bought the team some 30 or 40 years ago, and he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at some point in the past. And, and some, at some point, he, he created an estate plan um, to... Uh, deal with what would happen with the football team. He put it in trust. He named three trustees. Um, the trust had a no contest provision. It really um, it cut you off real quick. I mean, it was a great business succession plan, right? He created it during his lifetime. It, it, he was the trustee and he even stepped down from running it while he was alive and the trust ran it while he was alive. Uh, so, it, so you kind of lead up with that and then he died. So 
what are we talking about? Well, the Broncos, according to Forbes in 2019, was worth $2.65 billion. Um, we should all have such problems. Um, and yet here too, um, uh, not surprisingly, but Pat Boland had a first wife. He had two kids from the first marriage. He had a second marriage. He had five kids from, from the second marriage. Um, and, and the two oldest daughters um, from the first marriage decided to challenge um, Mr. Uh, Boland's capacity, claiming that in his estate planning documents, he lacked capacity, um, which we just talked about, and he was um, subject to undue influence. Um, and uh, according to NBC, that trial has been put off, but uh, I didn't have the links, but um, that trial is going to happen um, sometime this year. Right now, I understand that the trial date is scheduled for J July. And for those who are interested in this, it is going to be, you know, these types of issues, capacity, undue influence, a lot at stake, a, a sophisticated estate plan, no contest provisions, um, will be at stake. And, and um, I, I, Mike, I don't know if you want to add something and anything very, you know, I, I also just want to say that um, in the last, the last slides that, that Jonathan is going to circulate, we'll talk about dispute resolution. One of the areas that people are starting to talk about more and more that you see particularly in scholarly writing is whether and to what extent there should be arbitration provisions in trust agreements for disputes to be resolved uh, through arbitration. Um, there is a case in New York um, from 2005 involving a very famous rabbi whose grand, several of his grandchildren moved to have a guardian appointed for him. And uh, the court held that a guardianship, because it involves someone's liberty and civil rights, could only be passed on by the court as a matter of public policy. So I think the same rule would probably apply to whether a will should or shouldn't be admitted to probate. I think there might be a related decision, but how those assets might be divided and who might get what I think is fair game for arbitration. In, in the case that I just mentioned, it would have been a, a religious uh, tribunal known as a bait bin, which was um, a, a addressed by the court. And in this case, the trustees asked the NFL to arbitrate uh, the dispute. And the court held that the NFL couldn't arbitrate the issue of capacity, but in theory, it could arbitrate who um, should run the team, um, you know, whether it should be the, the, the daughters from the first marriage or whoever they want it to be, or it should be who the trustees want to pick. Um, and uh, it, it's an interesting aspect to the extent that, that arbitration or the NFL's involvement here um, may, may be an issue. And, and with that, I'm going to throw it back to Mike for the last two minutes or so uh, to bring home the program. Yeah, no, I think, you know, these, I, I think both the, the, uh, the Larry and the Pat stories are, uh, are turning into stories of failed estate plans and unfulfilled desires. I mean, Pat's plan, his trust laid out very specifically how the next owner was the person in control of making decisions at least so it's not necessarily ownership how that control was going to be determined he laid out a series of steps that one of his children needed to uh, accomplish before being considered by the three trustees to do it so you know it was, it was it's a detailed strong estate plan led by strong business succession plan um, and so you have that fight on undue influence and capacity, um, kind of a question of are those often brought merely because somebody thinks there's undue influence or incapacity, or is it brought for leverage uh, in an overall settlement? And, you know, I, I think, honestly, most clients who bring these, these matters think that there was some sort of undue influence, whether... You know, there's lawyers on both sides arguing it, so I'm going to agree, think that the lawyer who brought that matter uh, is is comfortable in his argument that in fact somebody uh, unduly influenced the testator um, to do it. Um, but you you look at it, it failed because of the family fighting. And in in, in, a, in the Broncos example, the no contest clause didn't scare anybody away, which is also fascinating because that's a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, the, the risk of losing your 20% share of that is, is real. So 
no, I, I think with that, I think it, those three stories, one good one, and then two kind of failed plans, highlight kind of the, the need, as Jonathan said at the beginning, of a strong team of estate planning around your, your estate planning clients, right? The advisor, the attorney, financial advisor, and an attorney, uh, the accountant, uh, kind of um, insurance professionals really wrapping our arms around them and working together. So I just like to, to to close by saying, you know, the verdict's out on 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 Larry and Pat. Larry's is more of an instance where um, somebody may have tried to help him get. I mean, I guess the 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 essence of the allegation is that someone tried to help him get around uh, the estate planning that he put in place. Because the question that I want to leave you with, it's still better to have a very good estate plan in place that can be. Um, supported uh, with contemporaneous documentation that it is not to have any, but be wise and 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 be aware that um, you know the the family dynamics took a long time to bake in the oven, and you never know how they're going to turn out. And with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out um, to Mike and or me um, separately, and we'd be happy to try to address them. Great, thank you so much, Stephen and Michael. Uh, if anyone has any specific questions, new business opportunities, or any other issues they'd like to discuss, please feel free to reach out directly to Stephen, Michael, or myself where appropriate. I'll be sure to include their contact information in the follow-up email to this program. As I mentioned at the onset, the goal of these programs is to stay up to date on timely wealth management related topics and to collaborate where appropriate. I think we can all agree that the clients who are best prepared are the ones who are served by a team of knowledgeable advisors. Two more quick items before I let you go. First, if you know anyone that would like to subscribe to my webinar distribution list, please have them send me an email with the word subscribe in the subject line. Second, and the next webinar that I'm running will be on Thursday, February 25th, entitled State of the Art Market, featuring Sherry Cohn, Vice President, Director of Valuations, Trust and Estates Department at Bonhams based in New York. Tomorrow, I'll send out registration information to this and all of my upcoming programs. I hope you could attend. And with that, this concludes today's session. Please stay safe and healthy. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.